Jesus Christ set aside his Godhead. I'm so delighted you're here. Our numbers are starting to come back. I hope you're feeling healthy. I hope you're feeling excited. We're going to try to finish up as we roll into summer. We're going to try to finish Galatians. My problem is I start digging into it and, and I just want to share what I get. And so I, it's not easy for me to just say, well, we're just going to cover 17 verses today because it's hard to do that. Paul went to a lot of trouble to write this letter. And the church has gone to a lot of trouble to secure this letter so that we can read an actual letter written by an actual apostle of Jesus 1,970 years ago. And that's kind of a cool thing. So today we're going to do it and we're going to talk about freedom. Freedom. Galatians 5, 7 through 5, 15. Now, let me tell you something that the neuropsychologists have figured out about our brain. Did you know that the human brain has a tendency to identify patterns? You will have a tendency to identify patterns even if they're not there. You can take something totally random and the way your brain is hardwired, you'll, 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 you'll see patterns that may not even exist. One of the classic studies that indicated this came about as a result of World War II. So Germany was sending these, these rockets over. The V1 rockets were being launched from France where German had possession, Germany had possession from France into England and into London. And the British were trying to figure out, does Hitler have some type of a navigation system on that rocket such that it can pick where it's landing? Because if so, Hitler had technology that the, the Allies couldn't come close to touching. I mean, now, yeah, you can pinpoint. They can send a rocket to take out one door on a building halfway around the world. But back then... They needed to know, is it random or not? So they took a grid and on, on, they took a, 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 a map and on that map of London, they plotted where the V1 rockets landed. And they asked themselves, is there a pattern here? And they drew the grid on it. And when they did, they counted four in one quadrant, 20 in another, 12 in this one, and 31 in that one. And this one happens to be where, where a, a lot of, of um, the significant government business is. And so the conclusion was, yes, Hitler's got some type of a navigational device. I mean, come on, what are the odds that you could divide this into four and have these big sections where important stuff is and... and, and you know, compare it to these other sections. Four? 31? Gotta be. Well, it turns out Hitler had no navigation device at all. That was just the intelligence service seeing a pattern where one didn't exist. So, for example, they could have taken it and divided it this way. I mean, who, who decides that you divide it in the way they did? You divide it this way, all of a sudden your numbers are 18, 10, 16, and 23. And it shows the randomness. But, but the intelligence service was able to find patterns where they didn't exist because that's the way our brains are wired. Now that means, A, we should be careful sometimes identifying patterns. But it also means, B, if you want to teach somebody something, it's very good to use patterns, repetition, and design because the human brain better understands it, better remembers it, better 
perceives it. And Paul does that here. Paul uses, in the passage we're looking at, patterns and word repetitions that make this more learnable. Yeah, y'all better get a little bit closer than where you were sitting, okay? I mean, you were like three rows back from there, and that was not going to do. Now, today, we're going to make three points as soon as those ladies get their Bibles out. We're going to make three points. Our first point is, what I didn't get to last week, the seduction of self-justification. And it's very seductive. It's very alluring. It's very appealing. It is enticing. And then we're going to talk about how the freedom to live is a freedom to love. And the final point we're going to talk about is the key community teaching that Paul had for the Galatian communities. So with that, fasten your seat belts, put your tray tables up, we're taking off. Here we go. Um, first, let's talk about the seduction of self-justification. I want to make one slight change to this. There we go. Paul begins with kind of a racing analogy. I think Paul may have been a sports aficionado. He uses sports analogies all the time. So one of his uh, analogies, and it makes sense, he was from Tarsus. Tarsus had one of the world's best gymnasiums. Uh, Tarsus was a, a town, of, a sports town, if you will. But Paul wants to ask the, the Galatian churches this. He says, what happened to your run? What happened? I mean, there you were, you're running the race, everything seems to be fine. And what happened? Here's the way he says it in Galatians 5, 7. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? I mean, here you were at trekete. Um, it comes from the Greek word treko. Treko means run. Like, I'm going on a trek. That means you're going on a run. Star trek. They're running through the stars. Okay, maybe not. But trek, the idea, uh, the, the tau, rho, epsilon, chi, omega, treko, running. And Paul just says, he says, man, you were running. You were running great. You were running well. Who hindered you? This word hinder, incopto, incopto means to hinder, it can mean to thwart, it can mean to cut off, it's got a wide semantic range of meaning. But here's the picture. Let's see if this works. Hmm. Okay, hold on, see if this on. works. Pressure, pressure, pressure. So we're coming up to the last lap, 28 on the clock. They're gonna, he's gonna run under, under two, 20. It's gonna be close, 131.9. They're off for two minutes, but here we go. One, 180 meters left. It's all down to these Running boys. Running well. There's five, a group of five. They're beginning to kick. DC are coming through. Looking good. This is it. The last 100 now. 100 meters to on go. The clock. Queens is kicking again. We have Niall Atwood to the front. Come on. DCU in second. Paul Peppard. It's neck and neck. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. Neck and neck. Jenny Mac. We have the bloody pole from the. <laughs> He will have to get through to the final based on that. I have never seen that in athletics. He was tied up like Spider-Man. The pole the vault guy just bamboes his pole vaulting and trips the kid up. That's what Paul's saying. You were running so well. Who hindered you? What Nimrod got in the way? Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Now, the typical Greek word for obey is hupakuo. This is not hupakuo here. This is, uh, uh, patho is, is um, not as directly obey. It, 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 it's generally a sense of, of being persuaded, being convinced, trusting. You know, you were running so well. Who tripped you up from trusting the truth? 
Let me give you another passage where Paul uses that word to give you an idea of, of its meaning. 2 Corinthians 5.11 is a good one to, to make a note of in your Bible to, to give you a fuller idea of, of that word. Paul says... Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. That's the same word. That's uh, patho, P-E-I-T-H-O. We persuade. So within the framework of that, Paul's saying, you were running great. You had this thing going so good. But who cut you off? Who dropped the trip hazard? Who, who, who meshed you up and kept you from being persuaded about the truth? See, the goal of the Christian walk is always truth. We're not chasing after a mirage. We're not chasing after a dream. We're not chasing after something that, eh, you got to have something. What we're chasing after is true. It's real. It's legit. And that's not just the legitimacy of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection, but it's the legitimacy of that being God's redemption for humanity and all that that means and how that means God loves you and God cares about you. And God is in the saving business because he wants to save you. And salvation isn't just an eternity. Salvation is a here and now reality that alters who we are and how we live. And we should be persuaded of that. And if something hinders us from that, then we need to learn to reject it. I got to tell you, this last week, there have been multiple times that things have just entered into my brain that don't belong there. And, and what, I mean, does worry belong in the brain of a Christian? No. Has worry ever entered your brain? Okay. So here's my latest. This week, well, not just this week, but what I've started doing is claiming a promise in Scripture that God will help me renew my mind. And when I'm worried or when I'm upset or concerned, and I know that doesn't belong there, Lord, renew my mind. Lord, renew my mind right now. Start rewiring that neural circuitry in here. Get rid of those old thought patterns. And replace them with the godly thought patterns. Renew my mind. I'm going to lay my worries down before you with thankfulness. You're going to renew my mind. You're not just going to do it by saying, well, fine, you don't need to worry, but you are just going to die. I, this is a, a truth. The truth is, be persuaded of the truth. Don't, you know, claim that promise. So Paul says, you were running well. Who tripped you up from, from your convincement or trust or persuasion of the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. Kaleo is the Greek word for call. We're going to see it again in a minute. Not an accidental pattern. A clear repetition to make sure we get it. Paul is saying that God calls you. What, what's tripping you up and what's causing you to, to, to not be persuaded by the truth is not from the Lord. So if it isn't from God, who is it? Well, you can ask Bob Dylan. <laughs> the Bob just happens to have covered this in his song, Precious 
angel on his saved album. The enemy is subtle. How be it we're deceived. The truth's right there. And we still don't believe. We are so easily hindered. And we shouldn't be. All of the practical how to live talk that Paul's going to give is premised upon all of the basic theology he's explaining. Do we understand that Christ dying for us is an act of love, service love by God the Father because God the Father is calling you by name. God the Father, not just, oh, I want them to spend eternity in my presence, but very specifically, I want to transform their here and now. I want to change how they live. God doesn't want you worried. God doesn't want you stressed out, except to the extent it might drive you to Him. So within the framework of that, if it isn't God, who is it that's persuading them from the truth? It's the subtle enemy. And Paul continues this thought with another analogy. He uses the analogy of baking. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. You can take just a bit of your sourdough starter, like Janet Seifert did. She's got a sourdough starter, in fact... She has told me that I can volunteer her to not only give you sourdough starter, but to teach you how to use it. Okay, she didn't really tell me I could volunteer her for that. But I feel like that's probably in her heart. So she's right over there after class, and she sent me a picture of her finished product she baked yesterday, and I suspect she'll bake for anyone who asks her to. I, again, don't have any reason to know that but I don't have any reason to doubt it but Paul says you know it just takes a little bit to really leaven the whole lot and of course leaven by the way to the Jews leaven carried a an Old Testament analogy of sin Uh, in in the Old Testament uh, during Passover you clear the house out of anything with leaven because it's sin it equates to sin and over and over you'll find in the Torah in the law passages that reference leaven as sin so if it isn't God who is it the enemy is subtle and he'll come in just for a little toehold and then he will expand his grasp in your life in your mind, in your mission, in your emotions, in your relationships, everywhere he can. And he does it so deceptively. I mean, you've got to remember, what, go back and remember the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus has fasted for 40 days. And Satan doesn't come to beguile him by jumping out in a red costume with a tail, pitchfork, and horns, breathing fire, saying, I'm going to take you on. Not at all. Satan does it seductively friendly I mean what could be more friendly than offering a starving man bread and that's the first temptation it's not nanner nanner I'm the devil it's hey bud I know we got stuff to talk about but you got to be famished so hey, hey hey if you're the son of God why don't you just turn some rocks into bread eat And then we'll get into it. We'll talk. I mean, that's the way he works. 
So Paul continues. He says, I have confidence in the Lord that you're not going to take a different view than what Paul's been writing this whole letter. And the one who's troubling you, whoever it is that's misleading you, will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Now you might be looking at that saying that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So let's break it down a little bit. Verse 10. Paul says, I have confidence. I love that. It, it, the, the word for confidence is this same word. It's, it's persuasion. I'm persuaded. I'm convinced. Who's convinced you not to obey the truth? Who's hindered you? Well, let me tell you what I'm convinced of. I'm, I have confidence in the Lord. My confidence is in the Lord that you're going to see the truth. And the truth is going to set you free. And whoever it is that's whispering this falsity that you have to live under the law to merit God's love. Whoever it is that's teaching you that is going to bear the penalty. It will not be without a harsh result. I get very, very frustrated at people who stand up in the name of God and make bold statements that to me seem to be the most unchristlike statements I've ever heard in my life. And I just want to get on the media because of course they get trumpeted on the media. They get media space and say, time out. That is not what every Christian is or believes. I will also tell you, I get really nervous at standing up and teaching. Because I never, ever, ever want to teach something that's contrary to the Word of God. Because people listen and they pay attention. And I don't want to hinder someone from obeying the truth, from being persuaded of the truth. And I know that what I say will bear consequences. And we need to understand that. That's important. And that's what Paul's saying. He has confidence. His persuasion is in the Lord. That the truth will out. And the deception will reap destruction. And then he's got this verse 11, which seems kind of bizarre. Where he says, but if I, brothers, still preach circumcision. And I think that this is a, a passage that's hard for us to understand because we're only hearing one side of the conversation. We hear what Paul's saying. We haven't heard what was going on in the Galatian churches that Paul's writing in response to. So we don't understand the fullness of this, but I suspect it's something like this. If you read Acts 16.3, Paul is out in the missionary area, and from around the Galatian churches, Paul has picked up Timothy and taken Timothy with him. And so you see here, Paul came to Derby and to Lystra, likely Galatian churches, a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. So here you've got Paul circumcising Timothy. And I suspect Paul's opponents said, Look, Brother Paul may tell you you don't have to follow the law, but even Paul preached circumcision. I mean, after all, didn't he circumcise our little Timothy? And so Paul's saying, 
if I brothers still preach circumcision, then why are they persecuting me? If if because Paul didn't preach circumcision. Understand. Paul circumcised Timothy for a very specific reason so that he would have a ministry among the Jews before the Jews became believers in the Messiah. Not because Timothy needed to be circumcised to be a Christian. Not because Timothy needed to follow the law to be a Christian. And so when the Galatian heresy is out there, when these opponents of Paul are coming and saying to the Galatians, hey, yeah, it's all fine and good to be a Christian, but you still have to live under the law. You still need to be circumcised. You still need to keep these holy days. You still need to, you still need to, you still need to. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You have been saved by your faith in the resurrected and crucified Messiah. Not by works of any law. And so Paul says, now, look, if, if they really want to say I'm preaching circumcision, then why would they be saying I'm wrong? Why am I persecuted? If, in fact, I was preaching what they're preaching, then they wouldn't be saying ignore Paul. But they're saying ignore Paul because I didn't preach that. And he says, and by the way, if I were still preaching the law, if I preached that you have to do to get, then the offense of the cross has been removed. Now we read this as good 21st century readers of the English language. And we see this word offense. Eh, what does it mean? Well, it's a very picture word for the Greeks. Scandalon is, is Scandalon's written here. Scandalon, it was the trigger of a trap. That's what the word is. The word is, if you, if you had an animal trap, and the animal's going to step on that plate to go get the cheese or whatever, and that plate is tied to this door that door is going to swing down and trap them that is the scandal on that's what it is and so Paul's talking to the Corinth uh, I mean to the uh, he uses it in Corinthians too but Paul's talking to the Galatians and he's saying hey if you if, if I'm preaching that you need to follow the law then a they wouldn't be persecuting me and B there's no scandal of the cross there's no offense. There's no trigger to the trap. When in fact there was. If we look, for example, Paul uses this word again in 1 Corinthians 1.23. And it's a marvelous passage that everyone needs to know. 1 Corinthians 1.23. Um. Oh, let's just back up. This is just rich. Okay? For the word of the cross, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us being saved, it's the power, the ability, the dunamis of God. You want to be saved? The only way you get saved is through the power of the cross. Christ said, nobody, nobody comes to the Father but by me. That is the only way to get to the Father, is to have your sins forgiven. Say, so, well, what about a child who dies at the age of six weeks? That child's sins were forgiven by the grace of God. The child's not old enough to trust in Jesus beyond just the natural trust that any child has at the age of six weeks. But don't think for a moment that that child's sins weren't forgiven and that child doesn't come into the presence of the Lord through the cross of Christ. No one can come to the Father. Abraham, Father Abraham. Saved, of course. How? 
by the cross of Christ. His faith was reckoned to him as righteousness, his trust in God, but the righteousness was earned on the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is foolish to those who are perishing, but to those of us being saved, it's the power of God. God's going to destroy the wisdom of the wise. Well, I know better. The discernment of the discerning. I can discern better. Show me the wise one. Show me the person who writes the Bible out. Show me the big time debater. Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Nobody ever dreamed that God was going to save the world by dying. Nobody ever dreamed that upon a wooden cross, the God who made the wood would let it be what took his human life. Satan never dreamed it. If Satan had known victory was in the cross, he'd have done everything in his power to keep Jesus from going to the cross. God made foolish the wisdom of the world. Victory through surrender? Since in the wisdom of God, the world didn't know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who have faith to those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks seeks wisdom but we preach Christ crucified no more no less Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews that's the same word scandalon a trigger to the trap to the Jews in foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's wiser than men and it's stronger than men. That's our God. So that's the scandal on. It's the trigger to the trap. But here specifically, Paul's using it in a sense of, of self-help. The idea that I'm going to do part of this. I'm at least going to make myself lovable to God. And the way this is an offense to us, the way this is a trap to us, the way the cross is a trigger to us is, is it strips our self-justifying tendencies. It's an offense to the trap of self-pride and self-help. We do not have any ability to merit the love of God. We just don't. And when we think we do, it changes who we are in subtle and deceptive ways. But we're listening to the wrong voice. And it might be seductive. It might be beguiling because it sounds good. So you want to blame me because I want to, to, to please God? No, no, no. But it's a question of why you're doing it. If this is you becoming excellent, that's very different than you honoring the God who's going to make you excellent. It's very different for you to say, look how good I am, than it is to recognize, Lord, I'm a sinner, but thank you for finding an ability to redeem me anyway. And when you're better today than you were yesterday, it's not because, look what I did. It's because God is transforming you daily into the likeness or image of his son. We just have a tendency to make it something that gives us self-pride when what we need is true humility. And if we don't, look, we, we do one of two things. We either struggle under the weight of our sin and our inadequacy where we just feel guilty all the time and we're stripped of the joy of living before the Lord who has extinguished 
the true moral guilt by paying the price for it. And what we're really experiencing is shame over who we are. And shame is not from God. But we either live under this incredible burden of not being good enough and being acutely aware of it. Or we live under this incredible pompous lie that we are. And Paul says both of those are not the Christian response and answer. We see the cross of Christ. We preach the cross of Christ. That means God reached out. Look, every person in here, you can reach up as high as you possibly can to grab God's hand. And some of you will be able to reach up higher than some of the rest of us. But I got news for you. God's still going to have to reach down all the way. Isaac Watts was a songwriter extraordinaire, but also a logician. He wrote a book on logic. He wrote books on science or what science was back in his day. Really smart dude. But he's got one of my favorite lines in an old hymn. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Second verse, forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my Lord, Christ my God. That's just, that's like, Pass the tissues to me. Man, that, that needs to be my heart. That needs to be my mind. That needs to be my soul. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my Lord. You want to say, hey, Mark, you did real good? Let me tell you who did real good. I, it's Christ the Lord, I, not me. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death. And then Paul... <laughs> Bless his heart as only Paul can. <laughs> Finishes this little vignette <laughs> with a very Pauline statement. He says, these people, now remember in the context of this, one of their big, the biggest hang up was, you know, fine, 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 but you've got to at least be circumcised. You Gentiles, at least be circumcised. And then we're not talking about circumcised a seven day old boy. We're talking about adult men in an age without anesthetic. And Paul's saying no to circumcision. As a requirement to please God. As a, as a ticket to enter. No. And so Paul ends it with, I wish those who would unsettle you would go ahead and just emasculate themselves. Um, that's the word for castration. He says, while well, they got the knife down there, instead of just circumcising, just... Uh, enough said. <laughs> that's the seduction of self-justification. Let's move to the next point. Paul says, you're free to live and you're free to love. James Denny was a Scottish uh, preacher if you ever get a chance to read James Denny's books, I love James Denny's books. Here's something he said. The aim of the epistle to the Galatians is to show that all Christianity is contained in the cross. The cross is the generative, it generates, it's the generative principle of everything Christian in the life of a person. Everything that is Christian in our lives is generated by the cross. It's the freedom that we have. Paul says it this way in Galatians 5, 13 as we continue. You were called to freedom, brothers. Actually, the Greek says, you to freedom were called. Puts freedom first for emphasis. To freedom you were called. Freedom. 
And so for freedom, think about it. Paul's been talking this whole book about being slaves to sin. And Paul says, you, you're not called to be a slave to the law. You're not called to try to live each day to merit the love of God. You're free from that. You were called to freedom. That's your calling. And I love the Greek word that Paul's being repetitive here. I told you he's being repetitive. Kaleo is the word for call. And it's got the idea of calling by name or calling by attribute. God doesn't just generally say, hey, anybody wants in, come on. He's calling you. He's calling you, Carol. He's calling you by name. He's saying, I have called you by name to walk this way. This is to be your attribute. This is who you are. You were called to freedom, brothers. So the question then becomes, what are you going to do with your freedom? Now that you're free, what are you going to do with it? Paul says, for freedom you were called, brothers, only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. Don't use it as an opportunity for the flesh. Now, the, the Greek word for flesh is sarx. Um, all right, sarx has got a lot of different meanings, in a sense. It can be used a lot of different ways. I've got Dr. Sherry down here. She's a pediatrician. Kids come to her. They're sick. That is a flesh sickness where... Yeah, I don't know. She got some kid with strep throat. Probably writes some something, I don't know, amoxicillin or something. That's that bubble gum stuff. But it doesn't come with baseball cards. Um, writes um, a prescription to try and deal with the flesh. Flesh is, that, that Greek word sarx means flesh in that sense, but Paul uses it in a little bit of a different way. He, he's using it as a metaphor for another way we're sick. F.F. F. Bruce says it this way, that self-regarding element, this is what Sarx is in the way Paul uses it here, that self-regarding element in human nature that's been made sick or corrupted at the source with its appetites and propensities, and which, if unchecked, will produce the works of the flesh that Paul will talk about, and hopefully we will, when we get to verse 19. Because the flesh, you want to feed the flesh, you're making a big mistake. You want to flee, feed that part of you that's corrupt. That's what we're trying to renew, is a corrupt mind. You worry? That's part of your flesh. You have anger issues? That's part of your flesh. You're greedy? That's part of your flesh. You covet? That's part of your flesh. You gossip? That's part of your flesh. You're sexually promiscuous? That's part of your flesh. You have trouble with the truth? That's part of your flesh. And, 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 and you feed that and it grows. But that's not what we're free to do. We have been set free so that we can have our minds renewed and we can escape all of the appetites and propensities of the flesh as we get transformed. And you say, well, I kind of like the flesh. Well, no, you are stupid if you do. I don't want to offend you. But it just ain't worth it in the long run. Do you really like to worry? You start putting confidence in the flesh and feeding the flesh, and you're, you, you may be feeding the flesh over here with gossip and greed, but you're going to see the flesh grow over here with worry or anger. You may be feeding the flesh over here with sexual immorality, but you're going to see it grow over there. 
because your brain is going to be wired to the flesh when we need to be rewiring it to the spirit. So Paul says, you were called to freedom, brothers, but don't use your freedom as an opportunity to feed the flesh, but through love serve one another. Now he's been talking about being a slave to the law, and now he's using that slave word. He actually uses two slave words throughout this passage, but here, uh, throughout Galatians, but here it's the slave word off doulos as, as a verb though. He says, through love, serve, present tense, moment by moment, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, serve one another. Now the word here for love, agape, agape um, means uh, um, not just an unconditional love, that's what we hear a lot, and there's truth to that, I'm not trying to take away from it, but it's, it's, it's that it's a decisive love, it's I'm going to decide to love. I'm going to decide to put someone's interest first. And I'm going to do it through service. I'm going to, it's, it's very practical. I'm going to, this is a, a practical, decisive love. And Paul says that's what you want to do. And, and he's using a kind of a pattern here, a, a word play off of servant. But he's ultimately saying if you want to be enslaved, don't be enslaved to the law. Be enslaved to practical love for each other. Caring for each other in practical ways. I was on a 150-hour Zoom call yesterday. <laughs> you know, I'm seriously, I mean, it was an important call, and I love those people, and I love my time with them on that call. But if you said to me, Mark, you've got four hours left to live. How would you like to spend it? I would probably say on that Zoom call, because that four hours seemed to have lasted about three weeks. Um, I was on a Zoom call yesterday, but one, and I'm glad I stayed on till the very end, because one of the things a brother of mine said, he's a, an ear, nose, and throat doctor in Tennessee. Dr. John said one of his New Year's resolutions was instead of saying, I'll pray for you, he just decided he's going to pray for him. Practical love, that's agape. You want to be enslaved, be enslaved to practical love for each other. Freedom to live is a freedom to love. Now, that's the key community teaching Paul has for them. Don't worry, we're going to end in four minutes. The whole law is fulfilled in one word. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he's quoting Deuteronomy there, uh, or Leviticus. I've heard it both ways. Um, Leviticus 19.18. I don't have time to compare Matthew 19.16 and following, but maybe I will at some point because that's a misunderstood passage that's just juicy right here. But if, if you shall love your neighbor as yourself, that's your community word. That's the way you react to each other. That's what you do. You agape, practical love your community like you practical love yourself. How many of you plan on eating today? Okay, that's practical love for yourself. Make sure other people can eat too. If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. <laughs> Be careful. That gun kicks and shoots. You don't need to be self-devouring. You need to be practically caring. This is the walk. This is the truth. And we should never, ever, ever get it backwards and think we're doing this to earn God's love. We're doing this because he set us free to do this. He's called us by name to do this there are so many practical ways I'm sitting here I'm looking at the people who have the the ministry <sighs> the name of the ministry yes missions greens point and tell us what you do you have one minute I'll repeat it shout it loud
English is second language, food, clothing, and pregnancy assistance to the poor people in Missions Greenspoint with the gospel. Have you suffered financially in the mission work that you're doing because of COVID? Yes. Do you worry about where the next dollar's coming from? Yes. But we're going to get over that worry because God's going to fix it. And y'all can give to Mission Greens Point. It's a 501c3, but even if it wasn't, it's a good thing to give money to. It's practical love. It's the easy practical love. I say, well, I don't have money. That's okay. Go volunteer somewhere. Come volunteer. Do something out of practical love. That's what you're free to do now. Here are your points to ponder. I want to grow in that love. Philippians 1.9, it's my prayer. Your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. You don't want to do the practical works that are just to get it off your back. Ah, uh, Mark said we had to do something. Sounds like Paul did too. Okay, we'll go do something. No. No, be discerning. Use your energy and use your opportunities wisely. Grow in knowledge. Figure out what's good to do. That's why I didn't just say give money to Missions Greens Point. I, I had Grady stand up and say, what'd they do? But then let's show our love. Let's not just grow in it. Let's show it. Let's be like the Thessalonians that Paul wrote about who, who have a labor of love. Where we work out of love, a practical caring that we decide to do, whether we feel like it or not. And your final point, let's remember where this love comes from. Because it's my prayer that the Lord will direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. So let's go to church, but let me bless you in the name of Jesus first. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask for your love to transform our lives. That you'll renew our minds and strip away that wiring to worry or that wiring to gossip or that wiring to greed or envy or strife or sexual immorality or lying or idolatry, putting things in front of you, bad priorities. Rewire our brains, Father, to be wired around the love of Christ where we are spending our time and our energy learning and growing and discerning through your spirit and how to practically care and love those around us to the glory of you and the cross of Christ. Through whom we pray, amen. Amen. See you guys next Sunday when I interview Jarrett and Debbie. It's going to be great. You don't want to miss it.